All right, folks, uh, we'll be starting right on time in about five minutes. People are sort of piling in right now. Um, we're actually oversubscribed to this, so hopefully um, you guys are the, the lucky ones. Um, we've got about 100 seats in here, and we had almost 200 signups. So um, you can go ahead. Uh, this I just finished the mortgage uh, presentation. I know some of you have gotten some emails um, that the um, that you, you meant to be on the mortgage one, but you're on the insurance. I'll probably blend a little bit of that. Um, some of this applies, but I'll, I'll blend a little bit of the, the mortgage stuff in here as well. Um, but one thing uh, I would uh, encourage you guys to do is to start submitting questions now. Um, and that way, as I go through um, this presentation, I can actually sort of customize it to your questions uh, because we're gonna be tight on Q&A time uh, for sure. So let's go ahead and you could even start submitting those questions now. Um, I guess just a quick sound check if you guys can hear me um, and see uh, the presentation on the screen, just uh, drop me a little comment so I know that all this is working as we get ready. All right, appreciate it. Awesome, thanks Greg, thanks John, thanks Bob, thanks Anthony, David. Appreciate you guys all being here. All right, Anthony, can you hear me? I, I just uh, kind of paused there for a minute. Sorry, just kind of doing a couple of little housekeeping things here. So hopefully you can still hear me. Go ahead and feel free to start drop, uh, dropping questions um, in. Uh, and I will, and, and again, just to kind of, as far as questions, uh, and again, you might kind of want to, to wait and hear some of the things I'm gonna say before you start dropping questions, but we're, we're really gonna focus on a couple big things. I, I wanna go at a high level. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about um, sort of how to make decisions, how to think about your sales and marketing during times of crisis, uh, kind of reshape your brain a little bit, um, think through some mental models. Um, I'd love to, on the question and answer side, just kind of hear some of the things that you guys are already thinking about or trying. Um, feel free to, to, to ask those kind of questions if there's some, uh, some things that you're already trying to figure out. Um, Yes, Felicity, there will definitely be a copy of the slide deck and the video on demand later as well. So um, we'll make sure you get all that. Um, the other thing we're gonna really focus on is uh, pipeline retention. That's so important, especially considering kind of the nature of this particular crisis. A um, little bit different um, uh, than the financial crisis that we went through, the mortgage meltdown as I call it, because I was in the mortgage industry at the time. Um, this one's got kind of that, it's got the financial crisis, but then later on top of this, we got this health crisis. So, um, so that makes this one just a little bit different. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. So, so any of those kind of questions around there, maybe techniques, we're going to talk a little bit about techniques. We're going to talk about, um, things that you can do to your website. Hopefully you guys all have at least a, a landing page, um, associated with your, your brand, your agency, uh, and you as an agent. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some things to do there. We're going to talk about content that you can be creating. Um, we can talk about the shift to digital. Unfortunately, a lot of you probably um, did incredible business face to face, um, and that's kind of all shifted online. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I think they're trying to work on that right now, Bob. He's had well, when are uh, government checks arriving so we can target sales better. So. Uh, I think they're working on it as we speak. I had CNBC on the in a, on the background, so I, I think they're trying to get a deal done today. So we'll see. Um, yeah. So with, you know, to that point, there are a lot of like uh, very uh, kind of unusual and unique uh, uh, pieces to to this particular crisis. So most important, continue to market, continue to do sales, um, keep your feet moving. All right. So it's four o'clock. Um, we got a big crowd. I think we're gonna, we're gonna max out our seats here, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and jump in to make sure that we have plenty of time for question and answer. Um, 
First and foremost, I just want to tell everybody as we're going through, go ahead and throw your questions um, in there. Uh, I am going to be monitoring that and uh, as they come up, I'm going to kind of layer them in into the right spots because we probably won't have enough time to get to a ton of questions uh, at the very end, but I'm going to try to do that. Um, the other goal for today is this is kind of a high level foundation. Uh, I have a lot of actionable steps in here. Uh, but depending on interest and depending on, on the comments and the chat here, uh, if you guys want me to, um, I've got prepared and thinking about some very uh, kind of focused uh, targeting in on some specific uh, components of this. So targeting in on what I do for email, uh, targeting in on what I would do for content, what I would do for website and some of those more uh, focused sort of webinars. So let me know if there's any interest. So with that, I'm just going to kick off here because uh, we pretty much maxed out our room. So we probably won't be able to get anybody new in here. All right, so um, I've been talking here for the last five minutes, kind of warming up uh, everybody and waiting for people to get in here. We are talking about sales and marketing, specifically during a crisis. Um, I'm gonna talk to it uh, from the perspective of insurance. Um, and so uh, I know that there are, because I got some emails, I know that there are, um, that there are certain of you who meant to sign up for the mortgage one, which I did uh, a couple hours ago, um, but ended up in the sale, this insurance one. So I'll probably try to layer in a little bit of uh, a mortgage. If you have mortgage specific questions, go ahead and throw those in there. Uh, can we text these leads? Um, is there a time frame? Um, so I'm gonna, um, that's a perfect question. Uh, it's super detailed. We're gonna talk about text messaging in here. Uh, for the most part though, with age leads, they are internet leads. Uh, so a lot of them are, um, through secure right forms and have those permissions. Um, but those questions are really a little bit of a question for an attorney. Um, and then time frame wise, again, depending on when you're buying 30, 60, 90 um, or older, um, that has a lot to do with it as well. So we can get into it. Maybe we'll even have a, a little bit of a legal uh, discussion later. But, but all right, let's start burning through this. So here's our agenda. I'm going to try to go st uh, step by step on how I build out crisis action plans for my clients. Uh, insurance agents like yourself. Uh, I do a lot with mortgage lenders as well. Um, and we're also talking to, uh, believe it or not, within our agency. Um, and this is, I've, I'm actually the, the owner and founder. We'll talk about this a little bit of Kaleidico. Um, I work on behalf of Age Lead Store. So um, we uh, do a lot of uh, sales and marketing training uh, in concert with them. Um, so we're also working with Senior Living. So all kinds of different organizations that are affected by this particular crisis. And what I want to talk about today is how do we keep our sales and marketing moving forward and producing revenue? So here are the four things that we're going to, to uh, talk through today. Um, yeah, home improvement, solar. I'm going to try to blend all that in, Larry. So that's a good question. I'm going to try to do as best I can to blend in as I get into those kind of pieces that are specific to insurance. If you have uh, solar or home improvement, um, solar uh, in particular to you, uh, specific questions, go ahead and, and throw those in there. So I'm gonna break it down into kind of four components. I'm gonna talk about monitoring and predicting uh, marketing changes, uh, then uh, actually creating a business sustainability plan. I know a lot of you are probably uh, in the middle of some fear and uncertainty around your actual business. I'm gonna talk about how to think about uh, creating sustainability. Um, as I've been through a couple of these crises, I know uh, it's obviously your primary focus is on surviving. I'm gonna tell you how to do that in a better way um, and to ensure your survival. We're gonna talk about uh, pipeline retention. This is probably the most important thing uh, that you can focus on uh, right now is how to preserve uh, and retain what's in your pipeline and keep filling it. And so we're going to talk about some strategies there. And then ultimately to identify and pursue new opportunities uh, that are being uh, created. And so a lot of times uh, people feel a little bit anxious about doing that, uh, but I'm going to teach you uh, how to feel comfortable with that um, and how to actually kind of look for those. Reverse mortgages, we could talk about that for sure. Um, I'm sure there's, uh, that, that kind of fits in a little bit with the refinance and the mortgage category. Um, and there's definitely going to be some opportunity there. So, all right. So who I am, just real quick, I'm not going to dwell on this long, but um, Kaleidico is a digital agency. We focus on lead generation. That's how we're in association with Age Lead Store. Um, and um, we've been around for over 15 years. And so as you can kind of do the math, uh, if you were involved in the financial crisis or you were in insurance or mortgage or any of these industries during that, 
um, you can tell that we've kind of been through this. So we went through this crisis with all of the same players, all of the insurance agents, all the mortgage uh, lenders as well. So we do have some experience, obviously, uh, like any crisis, this one has its own little nuance, uh, but we've kind of been through this and a lot of this feels familiar, especially to the financial crisis. Um, this is who I am, uh, Bill Rice. Uh, I have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I was back in the banking industry uh, when 9-11 happened. So I went through that crisis um, as actually the director of risk management uh, at a bank. Um, and then I went, went through the financial crisis of the mortgage meltdown uh, with Kaleidico specifically, um, because I had founded that in 2005. And then soon after, a lot of our clients um, got hit by this, mortgage lenders. Um, and even before that, um, I'm a veteran. And so in the Air Force, uh, I did counter-espionage operations, went through Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, as well as uh, the Gulf War. So um, got uh, some experience uh, in that as well, in sort of crisis management. Um, so all that I'm going to try to lend to you today. First thing I want to do is just a little bit of a uh, sort of a quick market analysis. Um, just the first thing that you always need to do in a crisis, particularly in a business crisis, is just really kind of get a lay of the land, start building your map of what really is happening. Um, and here's a few kind of um, sort of top level things uh, that are happening in the market today. Um, and you guys, again, uh, add in comments or Q&A, you're closer to the market than I am. Uh, so there may be some other things. But one important thing uh, to know right off the bat is um, risk, which is the business that we're all in, whether you're a mortgage lender um, or you're an insurance, uh, you are a brokering risk trade-off, right? You're, you're pricing mortgages based on um, the, the cost of money and the risk of repayment. Uh, if you're in the, the insurance game, uh, you're uh, exchanging a premium for some you know, potential risk of actually having to pay out um, that insurance. And so um, there are some traditional market indicators that we watch to understand pricing and how things work in that market and, uh, and what products are sort of appropriate. Um, the important thing here to remember uh, is that in these times of uncertainty, uh, particularly with financial crisis, but also now with this extra layer of sort of health um, uh, crisis involved, there's this unpegging, there's this disconnect uh, of risk. So for instance, um, and I was talking about mortgage before, and this probably also impacts uh, insurance pricing as well. There's sort of a cost of funds. And normally when those costs of funds go down, uh, like the Fed did, went down to zero, um, and the mortgage-backed securities uh, yield went up as well, then normally that means that, okay, the, the rates, the actual price that you pay for uh, lending that money or, or providing that insurance would go down uh, in relationship, in correlation to that. But uh, because there's uncertainty and because there's uh, maybe uh, repayments won't happen because people will lose jobs uh, or potentially people's risk of some of these things that you insure will go up. There's this odd unpegging uh, of the risk. And so now the risk premium gets placed in there in a slightly different way um, and things get quite a bit more expensive or harder to come by. Um, or as you guys are finding out, uh, a lot of people are coming in and asking questions about insurance uh, and viruses are not um, something that's, uh, that's accounted for in some of these or specifically excluded. And so there's this unpegging, this unusual, unprecedented circumstance in the market uh, that's causing some disconnects in the way the market traditionally uh, operates. Um, so currently, the most important thing as you're kind of figuring out the lay of the land is to know that the market is currently driven entirely by fear, uncertainty, and government actions. Um, so I'm sure that uh, Bob's uh, comment earlier about the government checks was a little tongue in cheek, but it's really important that you're tuned into what the government is doing because those actions are going to affect um, the products that you can provide, uh, the conversations that you need to have with customers, um, and uh, essentially how you target um, that market. Um, one of the good things about this particular crisis is that we're actually entering it in from a position of economic and credit strength. So to a great degree, a lot of the people that we serve uh, in all of these segments, uh, reverse mortgages, solar, mortgage, insurance, um, they all um, kind of entered this crisis in a pretty good uh, situation. And it looks like right now, based on government action, um, that the government's going to try to close the gaps and ideally, um, this will be kind of a short um, period, uh, uh, probably a pretty deep trough, uh, but something that we should kind of 
propel out of relatively quickly. And if you kind of prepare your business for that, hopefully you'll surge out ahead of everybody else. Um, there is uh, all of a sudden, not only an abrupt stoppage of business, but there's also an abrupt increase in commercial and personal risk. And so that uh, is, again, the state of the market that you need to be thinking about. In a lot of ways, um, this is an opportunity for you uh, to talk about these. Although some of these risks you can't insure now uh, because they're retroactive, but it's going to definitely create a market as we pull out of this thing that's going to be far more risk averse or risk aware, um, and that's going to create opportunities for you. So you need to start building that sales and marketing activity now. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then most importantly uh, of kind of all of these um, is that consumers are surging online for information. You can't sit down at the kitchen room table anymore. You can't do the face-to-face -face meetings. You can't do the networking uh, that you've traditionally been able to do. Uh, you're, they're all moving online. They're trying to get their information online. And you've got to figure out how to take your digital, your agency 100% digital. All right, so here's the quick breakdown of all that. We want to make sure that we're monitoring the market, but understand that the market is fundamentally broken uh, during these times of crisis. Um, here's kind of the best advice that I can give you. Um, it's like a coach uh, teaching a, a running back to be excellent. Uh, I'm from Detroit, um, and so that's Barry Sanders, if you don't know who that is. Um, and one of the things a running back coach will tell uh, a running back and you will see in a good running back is they always keep their legs pumping, right? Um, and that's really the best advice. We want to keep moving. We want to have a, bat, a bias towards action and we want to smash forward. We want to keep those legs pumping. We want to bounce off of those blocks um, and we want to make sure um, that we keep everything moving um, and smashing forward. My slides to move. Okay, here's the other thing. Um, as it pertains to marketing and advertising, uh, one of the things that I'm telling all my clients is, um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but during these crises, there is always a dip, sometimes even a crash in the cost of marketing and advertising. Um, so you essentially, if you're buying leads um, or you're doing Google ads or you're doing any kind of paid advertising, uh, know that there is going to be and there already is a dip in some of those prices. Uh, you're gonna see a little bit of this at the end because we're gonna offer you a 20% discount on aged leads. So there's always incentives in the market uh, during these times of crisis. And essentially what you wanna do is you wanna take the opportunity to buy uh, and acquire these customers at a discount and then nurture them. And we're gonna talk about how to do some nurturing campaigns and nurture up the curve. So when we pull out, we can pull out faster. And even during these times, we can have a bigger database to actually work on, which will create more opportunities when opportunities are thin. So ultimately uh, the goal is to stock the pond as cheaply as possible. And there's going to be some opportunities as we go through this crisis to do that. Therefore, um, we're ultimately trying to, and this is um, what this webinar is intended to do, is we're going to set up a crisis system, right? I always love working in systems, uh, methodically moving through um, how we kind of do things in our business. Um, and this is the components of the crisis system that we're going to talk about today and that you need to start setting up. So first and foremost, uh, you want to set up a mechanism to monitor for market change. Uh, in my particular case, uh, there's a few components to that. I have a big network of people that I'm already talking to, uh, colleagues, partners, people that I've talked to before. I'm emailing and phone calling them, getting their perspective. I'm talking to clients. I'm talking to insurance agents like you and mortgage loan officers, uh, people in the solar business and reverse mortgage. I'm constantly talking to all these people trying to understand what the lay of the land is, what, the pers what their perspective is, what are the challenges that they're running into, what are the successes they're having. And then later on to that, um, I use Twitter and LinkedIn, you should do the same, to start to follow and connect into uh, additional people to help you monitor that mar market. So you're really looking for uh, three components in the people that you're building into your monitoring system. You're looking for people uh, with experience who have been through crisis before. You're looking for experts that can actually tell you um, what's happening in your industry, what's happening with your carriers, what's happening uh, potentially with the virus itself. 
Now my Twitter feed's got financial experts. I've got uh, um, I've got physicians in there, so I kind of know what's going on with the uh, virus. Uh, I've got lead uh, generators, people telling me what's going on in the lead market, and then of course I've got my clients or loan officers and insurance agents. So so I want to make sure that I'm building a monitoring system to watch for market changes. You guys are already kind of looking for that um, in a traditional sense, but you need to kind of uh, build out those uh, circles and, and enlarge the things that you're looking at to understand what's going to happen in the market. Um, and then, of course, you want to stay in front of customers in a good way. We've talked a little bit about nurturing um, and sales activity. We're actually going to up um, the, all of those activities to make sure that we're not leaving anybody just sitting in our database without any sort of communication. During crisis, um, actually consumers, your customers, your clients are going to be more welcoming of communication. So you actually get the opportunity to sort of up your communication level um, during these moments of crisis just because they're, they're more willing uh, to kind of hear that voice and to understand what's going on. Um, we certainly don't want to neglect sales and marketing activities. Um, if you stop the engine, uh, then business will definitely start. So don't neglect uh, your sales and marketing activities. And in fact, you should probably be increasing them. We're also going to create systems that are going to seize opportunities to deliver value at a discount. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, this happens in advertising. This also might pertain to tools that you use. Uh, maybe your CRM, maybe there's going to be some discounts there. Um, so you're always looking around uh, in times of crisis. Uh, people are offering discounts or opportunities um, to kind of give you something of value for less. So uh, be aware of those opportunities. Make sure that your system kind of accounts for those uh, and brings them in and takes advantage of them. Government's going to take some action for small businesses. Make sure that you got a system to kind of capture uh, those opportunities and make sure that you uh, kind of get your uh, competitive advantage during this time. Uh, and then ultimately, your system, most importantly, needs to be growing and nurturing your pipelines. Too often, uh, people get uh, sort of depressed about what's going on uh, and they just kind of curl up in a ball. That's the last thing that we can do during this time. We actually got to, got to kind of up our activity and make sure that we're growing and nurturing those pipelines. They should not be contracting. They should actually be expanding during crisis. So one of the ways that, that I like to kind of think through how I build these systems and what I'm doing in, in uh, sales and marketing is through a set of mental models. And if you're not familiar with the term mental models, um, it's something that, that I've just gotten fascinated with over the, the years. Um, it's something uh, that you will um, hear uh, investors talk about a lot. Um, and Charlie Munger, who is the partner of Warren Buffett, um, is a, a huge fan of this and talks about them all the time. And essentially what mental models are, are those are things that are kind of structures and frameworks that have been proven over time and they become sort of intellectual shortcuts. Um, to things and how things work. And so you can, if you kind of study these mental models or you should sort of create some mental models, it will help you make decisions faster and more objectively. And so here's a couple that I want to kind of talk about um, and that I use in building this crisis system uh, that we're going through. Um, the first one that I like is the map is not the territory. So if you look at a map, no matter how detailed it is, even the maps that are on this page, as detailed as they are, uh, you can tell almost immediately that there's definitely still detail that's missing uh, from these maps, just couldn't be put on here. You need to reduce it so that you can actually get um, the more, the higher priority stuff on it, or there could be just inaccuracies. And in a moment of crisis, this is definitely the case. So as you map out your plan uh, and you build the, the structure of what you're doing in sales and marketing, understand that there is a lot of detail missing or things will change um, or um, things will become, um, it just won't work anymore, right? So understand that as we build this map and this plan, we need to be flexible and we need to be willing to adjust to kind of what's directly in front of us. The other thing that will give you a serious advantage, and this is something that I hinted at already, uh, is just a circle of competency. So understanding that you know what you understand, and it's important that you kind of take inventory of what you truly understand uh, about insurance, and that's probably even a, a tighter circle around a specific type of insurance, uh, but know what you understand and then seek expertise for what you don't. So uh, coming to webinars like this to figure out kind of the sales and marketing angle uh, to add to or layer onto your deep knowledge of insurance 
uh, can help you. And ultimately, it's important for you to kind of be honest about what you know um, and what you can handle in a crisis and where you need to kind of get help and get others to kind of do things for you that maybe you have less experience with or less expertise. So let's talk about some kind of some insurance specific mental models. And I'm going to actually, this is where I'm going to kind of layer in uh, as much as I can, kind of some of the mortgage uh, components of this. Uh, we need to think about how are premiums set? How, are the, how is pricing done inside of your insurance products? And potentially what movements might take place or what might change depending on what is happening in the world so that you can proactively start to position the products um, that you think are going to be more attractive or more necessary or priced more competitively. Uh, and you certainly need to be able to answer questions around why things have changed uh, in the products that you offer um, or the premiums that you charge for them. Um, what risks are covered? You really, really, really have to up your education. There's going to be a lot more hard questions uh, about risk as people uh, come in to get insurance than there were in the past because probably a lot of the people that you're going to talk to or a lot of the opportunities you're going to get is because they've gotten some coverage somewhere else that didn't account for some risk that they expected or potentially they're trying to discover how to kind of protect themselves uh, through something that may become more elongated um, or some other perceived risk um, that they're already encountering with their business or with their own personal situation. And so um, make sure that you sit down and kind of build a matrix around risk and know all of the, the uh, products that potentially you need to kind of bundle together or at least need to have good answers around. Um, how will this, how will everything, and there's, there's lots of, of kind of what ifs here, but start to think about how, what's happening now, how will it change healthcare? What new products will become available? What new insurance uh, will there be necessary? How will healthcare change? How will it get paid for? Um, does this kind of reshape, you know, there's all kinds of conversation about nationalized healthcare and uh, kind of how that plays out. So kind of looking at how all these other countries kind of played through this scenario with different healthcare systems um, and starting to listen and tune in uh, to the different conversations around how our healthcare system is structured uh, can definitely get you a, a leg up, uh, particularly in health insurance and probably some other related personal lines as well. How is this going to change business? There's some fundamental changes afoot uh, here that you want to start uh, focusing on and anticipating as you kind of uh, start to uh, build around temporary change as well as long-term change, but there's talk of sort of decoupling um, health coverage from employers um, and a whole bunch of different things. Obviously, commercial risk has changed significantly. Um, we talked about this, kind of what new products are gonna merge. Um, how will, depending on where you sit in this whole ecosystem of insurance, how will commercial insurance change? How will personal insurance change? Um, and then ultimately, um, how this will just change insurance in general. So uh, going through these models, asking these questions, sitting down and writing them down on paper um, is a really kind of important part uh, of building out your new sales and marketing crisis um, approach. Okay, so probably the most important part of this presentation is just business sustainability. Um, how are you gonna go about actually sustaining the business that you have? So first and foremost, and, and at one point, uh, I think in the very first slide, I talked about pulling out your legal pad and writing some things down. I don't know what it is about actually writing things down that, that actually um, makes you more objective um, and structures a, a better plan, uh, but I would recommend that you actually pull out a legal pad, get out a pen, um, and audit the facts. Um, by getting all of this sort of thought process and discussions out of your head uh, where all the emotions and fear kind of run around and putting them down on paper uh, has an amazing effect at actually creating uh, a more objective uh, and more effective uh, sort of plan. So the facts that I want to audit is first and foremost, I want to ask the question and write down the answer. What has actually changed? So despite all of the concerns and, and maybe all the fear that's in this uh, virtual room right now, um, if you guys really kind of sat down and wrote down what has changed, I would suspect for most of you over the last couple of weeks that this has actually been taking place in the U.S., probably nothing has changed really. Maybe you're working from home, but products haven't really changed. Pricing probably hasn't changed too much. 
Um, the actual uh, customer volume and flow probably hasn't changed too much. Um, so it's really comforting to kind of write these things down and realize that, that in all, um, a lot of things probably haven't changed. So that gives you some breathing room uh, to be a little more objective, to be a little more strategic in kind of thinking through your plan. So uh, investors do this all the time, but it's really important uh, to understand uh, this is how they spot value in the market, right? So a company announces something or somebody says something and that stock price goes down, but nothing in the underlying business has actually changed. Boom, that's a value opportunity. So we want to kind of go through the same exercise here with our own business. Then we want to think about what's likely to change. There will be things that change um, and we want to start to assess where we think this thing is going and what will change in our business. Um, and there's really two segments that are important. We wanna think about and understand and, and start to itemize on our paper, what is a temporary change and what might be more permanent or lingering changes. For temporary things, we wanna actually position ourselves and create systems uh, that are temporary in nature and that help to position us for the short-term changes and potentially the short-term oppor uh, opportunities. Um, and so this, has a lot to do with the way that we're messaging in our content and our email and our text messages and the things that we're talking about. Um, and then we wanna think about those things that are more permanent or lingering. This is the way products might change or the way the market might change or the way consumers might be, the, their, their brains might get rewired because of the risk that they're going through or um, the challenges and hardships that they're going through. That could be more of a long-term change. And so that's where you're actually starting to position how you actually do business uh, to account for and come out of the other end uh, in a stronger way for long-term changes. Okay, so let's get really tactical uh, at this point and very specific things that we're going to go and do. Um, so first and foremost, um, again, everything has moved 100% digital. So you have to think about every part of your sales and marketing system uh, that up until now has not been digital. Um, what are you relying on that relies on network, partner relationships, face-to-face -face meetings, um, uh, you know, gathering together in events, maybe you're giving, um, you know, uh, in-person uh, sort of seminars and stuff like that. Think about all those things that are actually not digital. Um, and we need to then start to create, create constructs and figure out how to uh, optimize in a 100% digital world. So the first thing is you want to update your website or your landing page to just acknowledge the situation. Let people know that you're, you're strong, you're in business. Um, uh, if there's any sort of business operations that have changed um, or ways that people communicate with you that need to change, you need to start acknowledging that and start communicating that first with your website um, and then uh, with things like email, uh, text messaging, phone calls. So start to um, change the way that you communicate with customers to be 100% uh, digital and virtual. Uh, you need to start crafting immediately uh, a conversation or a message around why now. So this is the first thing that's going to hit you. This is going to be your most popular objection is why don't I put my mortgage transaction on hold? Why don't I put my insurance um, uh, situation on hold. Um, and there's all kinds of good answers to why you should be doing these things now, why you should think about these things now. Um, as a part of that information and kind of working through and building that message, um, it's important to, to build relevant content. So go ahead and just type it out, write it out, uh, build it out, uh, make a blog post about it, create uh, some digital assets that allow you to um, actually connect people to or refer them to or link them to uh, a sort of a, an extended conversation or an extended education about the kind of why now topics and anything, again, that's relevant to them understanding insurance in this particular crisis. Um, and then ultimately you wanna be participating in the discussion. This means you need to be in social media, you need to be on LinkedIn, you need to be in Facebook, you need to be wherever those consumers are, wherever they're asking questions, wherever they're going to, uh, for information, you need to start to get digitally involved in those discussions. Just simply looking for people asking those kind of questions uh, is kind of a starting point. Turn to your email list. I'm a big email guy. Hopefully you already have a list. Uh, if you don't have kind of a formal email list, you probably have a whole bunch of uh, dead or kind of aging contacts sitting in your CRM. Maybe you inherited a book of business and you never really touched those because you're kind of working the face-to-face -face relationships. Um, look for places where you have 
repositories of emails. Um, and if you already have an email list, um, then we want to turn to that list. So in both cases, this is the most direct um, and quick way to reach out into your market to customers who kind of know who you are and potentially will actually react to you the fastest instead of just kind of blanket general marketing um, or starting uh, with, with brand new um, sort of uh, consumer data. Uh, it's important to turn to uh, those uh, repositories, again, of dead leads, of age leads, even when you're purchasing leads, at least when you're purchasing age leads or real-time leads, you're getting active inquiries. So we wanna to turn to and start to use email uh, to up that communication um, in all of these cases and kind of uh, get that, that warming and nurturing going on. Because again, it's your most direct access to consumers. It's your most direct access to revenue. Um, the second thing that you need to do is think about how to, you may have, uh, like any sort of regulated industry, you may have less control over this, but wherever you can, look for ways to reduce friction and make it easier to make a decision. So um, if there are kind of low hanging fruit or insurances that make a lot of uh, kind of no brainer sense, um, or you can do some immediate savings, try to look for opportunities where you can reduce the friction and you can give them a very quick win and just make the bigger decisions easier to make. To, to get that first product in that makes tons of overwhelming sense. And then from there you can bundle um, the additional products that um, could help um, out that customer. Ultimately, in all of these tactical sort of components, um, we are going back to the main point. We're trying to stock the pond and build our database to create more opportunities in the near term just by making that number bigger and then actually starting to build the process and build the contacts, build the relationships that are ultimately going to allow us to stock the pond so that we come out of this uh, faster and stronger. Okay, let's get into sales pipeline retention. Any questions? Again, remember that question and answer things uh, over there, uh, the comments, the chat sections um, available to you as well. So uh, go ahead and pop any questions that are coming up or anything that you hope that I get to uh, before we're done with this presentation. All right, so here's some keys to your specific pipeline retention program. So we're talking about um, the, the leads and the customers that are sitting inside of your CRM. Here's some really important things that you need to do uh, today um, or start doing today. Um, first and foremost, create and prioritize leads and call queues. Now, this is probably something a lot of you guys are already doing in the sense that you're taking in leads and, and based on some criteria or based on some characteristics of that lead, uh, you might grade them, you might prioritize them, you might determine when you're going to call them uh, and in what order you're going to, to call them. Um, but I would submit that in this, uh, at this point in time, uh, in the middle of a crisis, that grading and prioritization, the characteristics um, may change a little bit. You're actually looking to prioritize and grade um, potentially the, the revenue or the transactions that, that maybe are, are the most perishable, the most at risk, um, or potentially the ones that you can you can help the fastest and the easiest. Um, so potentially that grading and prioritization may reshape because of the nature of the current market and what's going on. Um, encourage you to, if again, you have approval, um, and this is something you have to either ask your lead provider um, to see if they're TCPA com compliant leads. Um, you can uh, take a look to see uh, or get um, a, a um, uh, an opinion from your attorney. That's probably the best place to figure that out. Uh, but in a lot of the cases, uh, the client, uh, the, the actual consumer record has given you permission uh, to text message them. If they're already in your CRM basis and you have that permission and you've, you've texted them before, um, there's a, a great opportunity to do that. So text messages um, can uh, definitely increase contact rate, but make sure uh, even in these times uh, of crisis that you do have uh, permission from that individual contact uh, to do uh, text messaging. But if you can, uh, again, that's something that will definitely increase uh, your contact rate. Um, another thing in regard to this, um, we, we talk a little bit about phone calls, but um, and this goes around compliance. Uh, you may, as you're doing your searching and filtering, particularly on leads and age leads in particular, 
Um, a lot of times people have in the past sort of discounted landlines uh, in favor of uh, cell phones. Uh, I would encourage you during this time, everybody's isolated, everybody's at home, everybody's sitting by their home phone. Uh, there could be some additional opportunity by actually looking specifically for landlines or actually spending and prioritizing more of your calls and lead queues uh, on landlines. So again, a, a tactic that's worth considering. Um, another super uh, important and highly scalable is email itself. So use email to nurture and scale that retention. So make sure that you've created campaigns that will actually go through um, that queue of leads and that prioritization and build out very specific drip email campaigns to make sure that even if you can't make phone calls uh, across all those, or you can't do text messages across all of them, at least you're making an email touch uh, and you're giving them every opportunity to be responsive to you. And then of course, that's gonna jump them up in the prioritization and uh, call queue and the grading queue. Um, leverage content for depth and education. This works really nice with email nurturing where you can you can put like really, really short emails which work really well. Uh, just kind of, hey, checking in. Hey, if you haven't had a chance, you know, take a look at this, you know, specific thing that I wrote about COVID-19 or how it's affecting the insurance industry. You can actually send over a link or you can attach uh, an attachment that gives um, greater depth and education to maybe what you would like to talk to them on the phone, um, but you just, you know, you can't reach them and they're not being responsive to the phone. So again, short email messages, use links uh, to attach to other content uh, that you've written. And you see friends doing that all the time. It's like, hey, check out this link. And then you just drop in a raw link. Um, those kind of email messages work super, super well. Um, and then last but not least, um, using best practices in segmentation and list hygiene. So segmentation, meaning that you're actually looking through when you grade and prioritize, you're looking at the characteristics of those leads. And if you are building out those nurturing campaigns, uh, whether they're with email or you're even doing text messages, make sure that you have um, all of your leads uh, put into the appropriate segment. So you know what they're looking for, you know what characteristics make them unique and group those uh, those folks together so that you can talk to them efficiently and you can scale uh, your conversations to them, but they, uh, they still stay super relevant because you put them into their own sort of limited segment. Um, and so you might have drip email campaigns for a couple of different segments. You, you, know, you might have it for, for auto and for life and for health. You know, obviously those would be different segments in the way you talk about them. The other thing is list hygiene. And this is something that's super important. Uh, whenever you get a list or you buy age leads um, or you're just kind of working your old CRM database, one of the things that we do for clients all the time and we're really focused on is list hygiene. If we find out that those uh, leads are non-responsive, um, or they're, you know, they're just, it, it, we're, for whatever reason, we're not reaching them or we're not resonating with them. We actually want to start segmenting them off. Um, and this is really important for email in particular because it can start to affect deliverability, but you also want to segment them off relatively quickly because you don't want them to, to clog up your call queue either because you can only call so many people. You can only text message so many people. So you want to get those kind of non-responsive. You want to give them the best shape you can, but at some point you want to start pulling those off and keeping your list nice nice and clean, even though it's smaller, that can, you know, feel like that's not positive, but in a lot of sense it is. You want that uh, list to be as small and tight as, and responsive as possible. Okay, another piece of crisis retention programs um, is, and some of these we've kind of covered a little bit, but one of the first things that I like to do is really think through the crisis and try to get into the head of the actual people um, that I'm going after or want to talk to. And so a lot of times we create personas when we're building out our sales scripts and our call scripts and our, and our email campaigns, we build out these personas so we can kind of get a visual picture um, and really understand who these people are based on the characteristics of the, of the lead of the actual data. Um, during a crisis, um, who those people are uh, and what they're concerned about radically shifts. So I like to redo, redraw up my personas of uh, people that might come into me and, and what they might be thinking about, what's different about them. And so as I'm kind of targeting uh, and segmenting my folks, I want to create a different persona. I want to create personas that are very specific uh, to the way that consumers and customers are thinking in this crisis. Okay, the next thing, I'm gonna take those personas and then those personas are gonna to help to drive the grading and the prioritization. So again, in these per personas, I'm gonna understand that certain of these uh, people, certain of these segments might be at a higher risk of falling out of 
my pipeline, right? So they might have um, all of a sudden, there may be a, a tier of a certain type of employment that's at a higher risk of, of losing their job. And as a result, um, their credit grade might change significantly. And so I wanna get those people quickly um, and that category of people, I want to move to them quickly and get them through the process and get them the insurance that they need. Um, the other category of risk could be people that are just highly attractive during this market. Um, they are the people that are going to go through the process uh, of getting approved and, and getting uh, that insurance uh, fine um, done, you know, so they're kind of the low hanging fruit. So I want to know who they are and I want to grade and prioritize those. So it's really important to kind of break out those personas in those segments and make sure that I can get to uh, and prioritize the leads that are going to move through my system the quickest and are ultimately going to pre present the revenue um, that is kind of the, uh, the, the lifeblood of what our businesses are today. I also want to look at my process and the workflows that are happening, and I want to think about um, how that insurance process works and how those approvals happen. And then I want to identify any potential uh, areas of, of failure or potential places where my process or my workflow can get clogged because uh, I want to um, have a reaction to that. And if something changes in the market, I want to know where that's going to create problems in my workflow. And I want to, to have an action plan. I want to have a plan B to make sure that my pipeline uh, and everything that's flowing through that pipeline is moving as smoothly as possible, despite um, things that might come up or things that may change or underwriting procedures or processes that may change on me. Um, so I want to know very clearly what that workflow looks like um, and as soon as possible identify any potential points of failure in there so that I'm prepared for it and I can keep that pipeline moving. Uh, the other thing is to support the sales process with relevant content. Again, a lot of you have probably been um, doing most of your business offline. And so taking a lot of those materials and making sure that you have uh, digital versions of those and making sure that those digital uh, sales collateral has been kind of rewritten or repositioned to be relevant to what's going on right now. Um, even looking for different ways to message and present um, the relevancy of the insurance that you sell. And that's probably going to be an easy process. Uh, but again, just kind of making it um, appropriate and acknowledging what's happening is going to give you a leg up when you're building that collateral and that content. And then of course, email, email, email. Use email to scale up this process so that you can talk to more people more quickly. Um, and again, get this pipeline, this sales activity, this marketing activity happening at a higher level uh, than it was happening before the crisis. Okay, here's my quick action plan. These are again, the four areas that you should be thinking about uh, specifically to digital um, that will actually get you in a better position uh, for uh, sustainability and to kind of just build out a better marketing plan. Uh, lead management, we want to think uh, into our CRM. So just take um, uh, a few hours to really kind of look at your CRM objectively, what's going on inside of that system, and start auditing to make sure that it's efficient as possible. Make sure that your grading and prioritization that you have probably built in there uh, is appropriate and is actually giving you and putting in front of you the best um, opportunities in the right order. Uh, we want to automate our call queues. Uh, again, this is something probably a lot of you do, uh, but we want to use that grading and prioritization to actually, you know, we all know we can only make so many calls in a day. Um, so the calls that we would make, we want them to be the high probability of success. And so uh, to the best that we can, depending on what your CRM system is and the capabilities it has, try to grade and prioritize and, and automate that call queue every single morning so it's ready to go. Uh, you know who you have to call and that the people in that call queue uh, have the highest probability for creating a sale for you. Um, like I said, uh, if you're capable and you have permission and your system allows you to do this, uh, leverage text messages. This is a great way. It's um, very analogous to email as far as how it works and how you build out your messages. Um, but if it's available to you, it is a higher contact rate. Absolutely use drip emails. During this time, we're seeing higher open rates and we're seeing higher click-through rates. Uh, you must have a drip email cam uh, campaign in place. Hopefully it's by segments, um, but it's certainly going to bring you more business by just simply doing it. Even if it's not the best drip email campaign, you're going to see some su success just by touching them. Um, we're going to talk about kind of how to do those uh, drip emails too in a little bit. 
ultimately be responsive. Um, every single response and inquiry you get, no matter how small or uh, insignificant it might seem, make sure you're responding to those and you're getting back to those customers as quickly as possible. Because uh, in this kind of time of crisis and uncertainty and fear, uh, if they're reaching out to you, um, they're probably not going to give you very long before they kind of reach out to somebody different. So make sure that we're being super responsive and that your CRM can support giving you those immediate alerts. Um, Keep the scripts and FAQs current and relevant. Do an audit, go through your scripts, go through your call scripts, go through your FAQs and really think about um, and, and even add in the questions that you're getting answered, that you're getting asked on calls right now. Make sure that those call scripts um, are relevant and they equip your sales team uh, with the objections that they'll get and the questions they'll get uh, relevant to the current uh, crisis and situation. Email marketing. Um, hopefully you're doing this. Um, if you're doing this, there's a couple things that you need to kind of keep in mind. Uh, if you're using marketing automation or you have drip email campaigns going right now, I would suggest that you probably pause them for a second until you do a full audit and really remember what's going out through these emails and making sure um, that, and I've seen a lot of this where they just, uh, they're not acknowledging what's going on. And so they sound a little bit uh, tone deaf. Um, and so you want to make sure that those emails are rewritten and, and tuned up to be relevant to what's going on right now. Um, audit every one of those email messages. Um, I would encourage you to be simple and personable. Um, a lot of times, a lot of our email automation uh, is flowerly, it's high design, it's got a lot of images in it, it's got a lot of pictures, or it's kind of slapped together with all kinds of, you know, big um, big offers and stuff like that. Um, in this time, people really uh, want to get a sense of authenticity from you. And so the way I'm doing um, for our clients is we're simplifying them. We're taking the, the highly designed out, uh, we're reducing them to, te to text, probably only a couple lines. We're trying to be as personal as possible, we're trying to sound like a human. Um, again, simplicity, uh, a sense of authenticity. Those are things that people value uh, to build trust uh, in these kind of times. Um, again, can't talk enough about uh, the opportunity to segment uh, based on the grading and prioritization. So the things that you think are gonna drop, the things that you think are gonna close the best, um, try to get them into segments and start try to talk to them very specifically uh, in a very um, direct uh, and relevant way. And then ultimately just kind of keep iterating through this process. This is why it's important to have a monitoring system. So you're listening to uh, what's going on in the news, uh, what's going on in the market, and then you can weave those kind of messages and those kind of things uh, into uh, your emails and into even uh, your other content and your sales scripts because they're going to then build trust on you because they've heard things in the news. They're going to hear you talking about it. You're the, you sound like the expert. It's going to build up that trust and credibility uh, in a significant way. So um, definitely uh, make sure that you're kind of keeping everything current and relevant and, and kind of moving through, especially in email. It's so easy for email to kind of slip out and sound like uh, you're talking in the past, right? Or you don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden it's just like immediate detection um, that this is automatic and not a real person and that uh, erodes trust. Okay, on the content side, if you're producing content, if you're producing blog posts, um, or you're just going through a process of needing to uh, adapt some of your offline marketing into digital content, the first thing I would do is just simply audit the editorial calendar. Look through what you're producing, what's coming up in the calendar, and making sure that that content is important and relevant to what's going on right now. Um, and for a lot of our clients, we've literally taken kind of this month's editorial calendar and we pushed it back indefinitely, and we're actually writing a whole new editorial calendar and slating a whole different set of content uh, to be specific to what we're selling and the services that we're offering um, and the actual uh, products uh, that make sense uh, in the current situation. And then of course, wrapping all of that situation into um, our advice and consultation inside of that content. Uh, again, support sales with relevant content. If you're in a marketing department that's supporting a sale, an insurance agency or uh, a mortgage lender um, or even uh, solar, again, a lot of these things are probably, a, uh, there are a lot of calls, set, setting appointments, 
uh, particularly in solar, and then you're going out there and kind of interacting with the customer, you have to figure out how to turn some of that into some digital. That's where content can really help you to educate that customer a little bit further down the line. So that potentially instead of a face-to-face -face consultation, you can actually do more of that on the phone, or you can do more of that via text message. And then maybe they just go out there and do some in inspection and take some measurements, those sorts of things. So content can be a real enabler. Uh, to kind of help you move that process into digital so that none of that stuff slows down. So things that are traditionally done offline, uh, you can support that by uh, creating kind of a more uh, disciplined process. They feel more comfortable because it's like, oh yeah, there's a process and there's this paperwork that goes through, it's all digital. Uh, just looking organized uh, can have a big effect. Some of the content that you should be creating, uh, guides to what you do, checklists, articles, things that explain kind of how your process work, uh, create those again in digital form. So that's as easy as, you know, going into Google Docs or creating a, a Google slide presentation like this and turning it into a PDF and being able to hand it out uh, in response to questions uh, that your uh, clients or customers have. Or again, sending that quick email out and a link to it uh, can be super, super powerful. If you're comfortable with video, um, or even doing a presentation through video like we're doing right now. But if you're in particular, if you're comfortable kind of getting in front of that camera, uh, go ahead and do those videos and send off a link to the video because uh, it can make it feel more personable. They can kind of see you face to face. Uh, you can certainly do Zoom calls and stuff like that. That's becoming more and more comfortable. Even people that are not in the business world, uh, just regular consumers are actually getting familiar with Zoom and doing Zoom calls. So definitely consider, consider uh, adding video into your content and your communications uh, spectrum. Um, writing relevant scripts and FAQs. Uh, again, if you have uh, the luxury of having somebody writing content for you, uh, get those content creators or your agency or people like us, um, get them to help you kind of uh, rewrite those scripts to be relevant and build out FAQs to help you overcome objections uh, that are specific to what is actually happening. Last but not least, uh, SEO PPC lead buys. This goes to advertising being at uh, a discount and there's lots of opportunities. Uh, to buy low and stock that pond and really build up a big database that you can nurture. So you want to be um, actively monitoring um, new opportunities. I can tell you right now, and this is something that we're monitoring, there are surges in brand new uh, search keywords, search terminology. People are trying to figure things out. Um, I had one of my buddies uh, in the industry and in, in SEO uh, just talking about the surge in uh, terms like uh, COVID and insurance or what insurance covers uh, coronavirus and all these kind of coronavirus modified uh, insurance in, uh, in questions. And so there's a lot of opportunities uh, to dip in with the SEO and build content or dip in and actually buy it directly from Google ads and buy some of these newer uh, keywords that um, aren't necessarily quite as competitive yet. And you could potentially kind of be the first to educate in that market. All right, so that's, if you're going to take a screenshot of anything, or you're going to take a picture of anything, um, or you're going to look for this later in the slide deck, um, this is the slide that you want to take and sort of use as your checklist. Um, a replay of this, yes, uh, Alfina, we are definitely sending out a replay and also the slide decks. Again, we're getting towards the end, so make sure that you get any of your questions in here. Okay. This is just kind of uh, something that I'm just trying to reiterate to all my sales and marketing uh, clients. And that is just the concept of do good, but understand what's best. So in these times, sometimes we're, we're kind of not focused on seizing opportunity because it just, for whatever reason, uh, we get kind of hung up and we get clogged on the fact that we are looking for opportunity and, and people try to put the label of being opportunistic around you. Um, you really can't take on um, that um, kind of mindset. You do have to be uh, open to opportunity because essentially everything that's going on is changing the marketing landscape. So you're either going to take advantage of the opportunities that are being created and move out of this in a strong way so that you can serve your customers through um, through this downturn uh, and also on the other end because your business survives um, or you're just going to go away. Um, so this is the mantra that I keep saying, do good but understand what's best. Um, we should all be empathetic. We should be taking care of our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to understand what's really important. Um, and so we need to understand that the best thing that we can do is number one, stay in business. 
Um, that's ultimately the number one objective for you and the number one focus around your crisis marketing and sales system. Number two, uh, we want to make sure that we can uh, efficiently and error-free, uh, oh, this has got a little bit of a mortgage flavor in it. Uh, this, so efficiently and error-free lend to qualified borrowers, but in the sense of insurance, we want to make sure that we can efficiently and error-free issue out the insurance um, to our customers, right? And so this is really critical. When we're looking to stay in business, the thing that can kind of gum you up the most is if we're making a lot of mistakes. Um, and the people that could move through our sales pipeline and could turn into revenue, um, we are so frantic um, or we're so overwhelmed by the situation that we start to make little mistakes. Uh, we start to gum up, we start to frustrate the consumer, we start to make uh, mistakes that actually prevent us from getting the product to the consumer. So be really careful uh, to make sure that our workflows are efficient and error free and you keep your team, uh, if you have a lending assistant or you have uh, assistants that help you uh, with the insurance process and workflow, uh, make sure that you're keeping them comfortable and positive so that they can kind of uh, make sure that your production pipeline is moving through uh, efficiently and error free. Um, and then you want to do that as fast and as frequently as possible. Um, again, your number one priority during these times is keep revenue flowing and keep it moving through as fast and efficiently as possible. Ultimately, the number one thing you have to remember is it's okay to pursue opportunity. And when we're pursuing opportunity, we're looking for a couple different categories. One, we're looking for short-term opportunities, right? We're looking for things that are gonna change in the moment and potentially are gonna create opportunities for us uh, to generate more revenue uh, because people uh, in crisis are going to need things and they're going to need your services and your products. And so look for those opportunities to source to serve that short-term need or potentially that point in time need. Uh, then we want to, as we're looking through this, and this goes to kind of the earlier mental models that I was talking about, think about how your industry is going to change. How is the insurance industry going to change on the other side of this crisis? And make sure that you're preparing your agency and you're positioning your agency for those long-term opportunities. A lot of that is just, again, stocking the pond, making sure that that database is growing and that pipeline is growing uh, so that you have long-term viability and you have a lot more people to talk to uh, as we come out of this crisis. Don't paralyze yourself uh, with the unimportant or the moral dilemma. Uh, we just kind of saw this um, with Congress, right? They went through this, they knew this big thing needed to be done. They knew that what they were doing was important to moving Americans through this crisis. And what did they do? They got gummed up by these little incremental sort of moral dilemmas along the way, whether or not you know, somebody could do stock buybacks, whether or not somebody can continue to offer uh, dividends, whether or not an executive can pay themselves, whether or, or not um, you know, airlines will think of the environment when they start flying again. They got trapped and gummed up by all these kind of little things that aren't important. So when you're making these decisions, pursue the opportunity, um, go after them as fast and furious as possible, go with overwhelming action. Um, and then you can kind of sort out all the little details before. Of course, this doesn't mean you, know, you shouldn't do anything illegal, you shouldn't do anything immoral, right? But the point is don't get gummed up with all the little details. Um, think fast and furious. And this kind of goes to the fourth point, keep moving, take a bias towards action. If you're thinking, should I do this or should I wait or should I make this one more thing just to make it a little more refined? No, just go ahead and do it. Then you can sort out and make the process more efficient uh, as you move forward. All right, this is what all of you have been waiting for and the people who have been diligent about uh, kind of walking through this. Again, um, if there's any questions, uh, go ahead and throw those last questions in because we're gonna wrap up in the next uh, probably two to five minutes. But I do want to um, make you aware of a couple special offers that we have. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Age Lead Store. Um, most of you uh, probably are familiar with Age Lead Store and have bought Age Leads. Um, this is the best way, the most affordable way to really stock the pond um, and buy these uh, internet leads that give you all the opportunities um, to uh, get in touch with and enlarge your database and give you more people uh, to do the drip email campaigns and to call uh, on the phone. Um, so this, again, is the best way to stock your pond. Um, Troy has given us a 20%. Uh, discount off the next or order by using the promo code OVERCOME. So that's 20% off of your uh, next order. So I encourage you to do that at Age Lead Store. Again, big believer in that. 
um, make sure you're building those systems uh, to contact those. Um, those, especially in this point in time, are probably as productive or more productive than real-time leads, and they're definitely uh, more economical. The second offer, and this is something that a lot of times people run into, uh, I know they get real-time leads or age leads, or maybe they just got a book of business that they uh, acquired or were given as they entered the agency, or they just got a CRM with a whole bunch of neglected dead leads. I'm telling you, there is gold in there. Uh, but sometimes uh, maybe you don't have the technology or the technical inclination to actually know how to do the drip email campaigns. Um, so today I want to offer to you um, the opportunity for Kaleidico uh, to actually nurture your old leads for you. Um, the cost is only $500 a month. Uh, and we can nurture up to 2,500 or 2,500 leads every single month. So you can put 2,500 in there today. Uh, we can start the nurture program on those. Uh, and then next month, you can put an additional 2,500 in there. If you have more leads than that, um, you can reach out. You're going to get Kelly's uh, email and phone number here um, after this, or you can even just submit at kaleidico.com forward slash age leads. If you have more than 2,500, just talk to us and we can um, tell you what the, the incremental cost for that. But if you would like for us to nurture the leads for you um, and just give us anything that you think is old or maybe you're buying age leads from age lead store and you just like somebody to actually nurture them and give you the opportunities for you, go to kaleidico.com forward slash age leads. The way that that works, um, and this is kind of what makes it really powerful, um, is we take those leads. Uh, we actually run them through our verification system. We're going to tell you a report that says, hey, these are good. Uh, these are potentially bad or uncontactable or ones that we should not be mailing. Um, and then we're going to give that report to you. Um, and then the next thing is we're actually going to then run them through uh, our proven uh, lead nurturing campaign system. And then as they uh, inquire, respond, or answer back, or fill out a new lead form, um, as those become essentially real-time leads, we warm them up and into new inquiries, we're going to post those. We're going to either, depending on your CRM system, we're either going to email them to you in real time, or we're going to post them into Slack if you use Slack, or um, we also support a lot of different CRM systems, so we'll post those uh, new inquiries into your CRM system. So really a great service that just says, hey, Here's all my leads. Go ahead and warm them up for me. Uh, and then we give you the live ones so that you can be working on all of your uh, more higher priority leads. And we can take your dead leads and hopefully turn them into gold. All right. Uh, any questions? Any last minute questions before we wrap up? Any questions about Age Lead Store? Any questions about uh, the lead nurturing from Kaleidico? Okay, um, you should within about 24 hours get a copy of the slide deck. You'll get uh, a copy of the video uh, as well. You'll have it on demand. Um, the, uh, the promo codes uh, will run through uh, to the end of the week. Good question, Anthony. So those promo codes. Uh, Paula, for the $500 a month, we're not actually calling. That is just to manage the uh, email drip campaigns. So the cool thing is if you give us 2,500 leads and, you know, you get uh, a couple new deals out of it, uh, you more than pay for it. We try to make it super economical. Um, the age leads sold. That's a good question, Althea. That's something that you would ask uh, Troy on, on a, um, if you were to order. Um, it's sort of dependent on the, the leads that you're buying. But um, generally, the way that kind of age leads work, just to kind of go uh, answer that at a high level, and then again, if you order age leads from age lead store, you can ask that question specifically to Troy. Um, but essentially, what happens is they're real-time internet leads, um, and those generally have a number of times that they can be sold. Um, and if the internet lead provider doesn't sell all what we call all the legs, so if you can sell that uh, five times, um, then for whatever reason, that internet lead provider, the person who generated it, maybe only sold it two times or three times. And so there's a couple more sales left on it. Um, and that's what comes out of age lead store is those additional legs. So um, potentially um, they have been um, uh, actually called before or talked to before, but because of the age, by the time that you actually buy them in those 30, 60, 90 day increments, um, usually there's no one currently calling on them. So in essence, they're kind of um, they're, they're kind of exclusive to you, uh, but they have been uh, sold before for sure. Um, is CT back again yet? I'm not sure what CT is. 
Andre, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it up. It looks like our questions are kind of um, wrapping up. All right, so um, again, take a look at the contact information there. We're available. Uh, would encourage you, again, check out Age Lead Store. Make sure you register uh, and create an account and then go ahead and do your searches and filters in there because you can actually order directly on there and check out uh, what leads are available. If for whatever reason um, you don't get enough leads or, or the filters don't produce the, the lead results that you want, uh, go ahead and reach out uh, to myself or Troy and we will make sure that we go and get the leads that you need. Um, and then last but not least, if you want Kaleidico to nurture those leads for you, um, go ahead and submit. It's just a, a sign up um, and then Kelly and I will reach out to you directly to kind of work through the details, but uh, just go sign up at kaleidico.com forward slash age leads. All right. Um, hope all you enjoyed that. We are going to do some more specific ones. So kind of watch the email list and watch the other kind of marketing channels where you saw this. And we're going to get uh, more detail. We'll probably do one on calling. We'll probably do one on email. So there's going to be some more specific ones coming up. All right. All of you have a great day and we'll talk to you on the next one.